So here's the background um, of my history. Just, just to let you know who I am, like where I come from. Um, I grew up on a farm an hour south of here. Here's a small picture of it from Google, Google Docs, or Google um, Satellite. Google Earth doesn't look Google small. Earth. This is 14 and a half acres right here. <clears throat> and um, anyways, my dad grew up right there in that house. And I grew up over here. And uh, this is the chemical shed, the most dangerous shed in the world. You can't just walk in it without knowing what you're surrounded by. <laughs> but it's pretty toxic. These are mums right here in these greenhouses. And um, here's a large greenhouse. This one right here is it by itself is two and a half acres right there. We've got two loading docks for like, you know, we can load up like eight trucks at a time, like big semi-trucks. Each semi-truck has 2,000 flowers. And um, anyways, it's kind of a big operation. But anyways, I grew up, I started working on the farm when I was nine. <clears throat> and um, the, um, I learned a few lessons. One lesson was, you gotta get the work done. So, for example, my dad would say, sweep that greenhouse, and I had to sweep it. And at the end, he could look and see whether or not it was swept. Okay. Now, in chiropractic school, I'll just cut real ch to the chase. People would adjust the neck or adjust the back, and that was their end product, was the noise that was coming out of the person's spine. But that doesn't mean that the person's going to have less pain or they're going to have more range of motion or it's actually benefiting their body. Because there's some people that get an adjustment and it hurts because it's a little micro trauma. So, I, you know, and I, I just like saw through that, like, okay, just because you adjusted somebody's neck doesn't mean you've actually helped them. Now, in most cases it does. Um, and I, then I decided later to be um, a, a chiropractor who focuses on nutrition. So we deal with supplements and food choices. Those are our two primary tools. We have a few other toys that we play with. I, I'll show you a laser that we have here later on. But it's food, it's food choices and supplements. The supplements include herbs, homeopathy, and animal glandulars, and combinations of all this stuff. So that's, um, those are our tools. And then we, we have a better chance of getting people well. And we have another chiropractor here. I still do chiropractic. But it's mostly food choices and supplements. Easy enough, right? So we do um, a muscle testing procedure where you hold your arm up. Raise hand if you're not familiar with this at all. Like the patient holds their arm up like this. The practitioner pushes on their arm and does things to the body. Kind of come on up. Let me just demonstrate this right now. Because this, this does play into DNA. Um, and it may take me 10 or 15 minutes to get there. But just follow me this whole way and we'll get to the DNA, okay? So hold your left arm up. And um, when I pushed, pushed down on her, raise your hand if you're not familiar with this at all. Okay, only two people. All right, thanks. So you guys, here we go. So when I push on her arm, her deltoid is strong, like that. And then I do something to her body, for example, touch her thyroid. And I'm irritating her thyroid just by contacting it. And then her arm, I don't know if you're pretending or if it's really not pretending. Not pretending. So her thyroid is not happy and her arm goes weak. So then we have to find something to make that become strong. Let me just grab, I got this whole case of supplements and there's a thyroid supplement here. Let's just see what happens. So her body doesn't want that to fix the thyroid. What do you think it would be? Organic bone minerals. Okay. So there's organic bone minerals and that becomes strong. So her thyroid likes it, her thyroid's happy. And um, two things that'll, that'll work. So <clears throat> now it's easy to see that <clears throat> when you're, when I'm on her thyroid, if her thyroid's stressed out and then I'm poking at it even more and irritating it even more, her arm will go weak because her mind goes to the thyroid and it's trying to pay attention to this and trying to figure out like what's going on here. It can't pay attention to the deltoid and the thyroid at the same time. It's got to choose one over the other. So if I'm poking at her thyroid and it's strong and robust and healthy, I could poke at it and squeeze it and tickle it and punch it or whatever, and the mind can still pay attention to the, delto the deltoid the whole time. That's why the arm would be strong with a healthy thyroid. Follow me on that? 
Okay, good. So then I put this, this supplement in her hand, and then her arm became strong while I was touching her thyroid. So the, this has an energy field. It's about this big, and then our bodies have an energy field, and it can be here or out here. It can be kind of big, or it can be really small. But anyways, there's two energy fields, and um, the body's energy field reads this like Terminator and analyzes it and decides whether or not it likes it or not to fix the thyroid. So the first one, the arm was weak, and the, her body said, no, this won't fix my thyroid. But when she held this one, the arm became strong and said, yes, it will fix my thyroid. So, hi. hi. There's a chair right here, if you can squeeze in. I hope you're not the fire marshal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's cool is that we have this energy field that I'm talking about. And we deal with the energy field every single time that we test a person. Now, contacting the body, we're creating some ischemia, which means loss of blood flow. We're contacting the nerves that are, have just come out of the thyroid. We're contacting what's called the dermatome, which is a part of the skin. that's innervated by nerves that come off the spine. And there's these dermatomal patterns around the, the body. But also, too, we got the acupuncture points and the acupuncture meridians, which are actually lines. So now we're getting more into the energy field. This is not new stuff. I mean, you know, Japan and China, they've been using, you know, acupuncture meridians for 5,000 years. And, um, and it's all measurable. There's devices to measure where the lines are. There's devices that, you know, there's um, machines that measure how, like you can, have, you know, the solar plexus right here. Plexus means that there's a bundle of nerves that are hanging out right there. It's kind of like a mini brain, if you will. And you get punched in the solar plexus and you can't breathe. But the point is, there's just more energy coming off the solar plexus. There's more energy coming off around the belly button. There's less energy coming off this part of the arm compared to the solar plexus. So this energy field has like a, it has an anatomy to it. It's got a geography to it. And for some parts, like if you have an ear infection, for example, the energy of this, this part of the body will be really tiny and small because it'll be absorbed, it'll be like concentrated right around the ear so that the immune system can try to kill the infection. If your ear is healthy and there's no infection, the energy can be like really big like this. So, um, at, you know the Kellogg Eye Center right at U of M Hospital? Yeah. They have a camera. It's 600,000 times uh, frames a, a minute or something. It's super, super, super fast. And, it's, and it, it can see things at a microscopic level. It's a really fancy camera. And I, I've seen the video, but I haven't seen it online. I don't, you know, I don't know where, you, where else you can find this video. But I was at a seminar, and... Um, the guy showed the video, and what happens is, when you have a bacteria invading your body, the, the energy field identifies the bacteria. That's step one. The energy field identifies the bacteria. Step two, it sends calcium to the bacteria, the bacteria being plural. Step three, the white blood cells follow the calcium. So it's not like the white blood cells are looking and they go, oh, look at that, I'm going to kill that. No, white blood cells are dumb. It's the energy field of the body. That's the smart thing. It identifies bacteria, sends calcium, and then the white blood cells go and they follow the calcium. So, when, and so we have a couple of supplements. We got calcium lactate. We got another one called Conjuplex, which is 25% calcium. And these are both really good for the immune system. And when, when you hear the word calcium, don't just think bones, 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 bones. You gotta think immune system too. There's that very small percentage of calcium that's in the blood, it's in the tissues, and that's what our bodies use to move the white blood cells, just transport them to you know, an area of infection to kill the, the bugs. So the point here is that there's this energy field and it's smart and it analyzes and it makes things move and it turns on chemical reactions it turns off chemical reactions. Okay, so like, everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Still following me? All right, so <clears throat> I, I saw a video on YouTube, and there's this guy named Dr. Tennant, T-E-N-N-A-N-T, -N -N -T. he's from Texas. He's the guy that developed LASIK eye surgery. And, um,
I just wanted to see if I could get this iPad to work. That's why it's up. There's no other reason. <laughs> no, I, just, I just have a few slides to show you. But okay, so anyways, Tennant, he, he, it took him, what, eight years or something to create this laser technology. And he's looking over people's faces and looking at their eyes and their breathing on them. And he contracted a virus. And it put him in bed for like five years. And he had one hour per day of lucid thinking. And during that hour, he scrambled to try to figure out like how he could get well again. And this is all in this fantastic video. He was actually at a um, at a health um, health fair in Texas with tables and vendors everywhere, and they're selling crystals and music and supplements and all kinds of stuff. And he said that he said that um, all these vendors, all these products, all these services—the yoga, the meditation, the stretching, the exercise—he said it's all to do one thing. And that is to move electrons. You want to move electrons into your body, and you want to use those electrons, and you're going to be releasing electrons. So that's why there's some people that they put a crystal in their pocket, and they feel a difference because that crystal has electrons. And then other people, they, they need to power lift. And you can create your own electrons by exercising or yoga or Pilates or something like that. And of course, you're going to get more electrons by eating a carrot versus eating a Twinkie. The electron, there's just more electricity in vegetables or you know foods from Mother Nature than processed foods. Okay, so that really like put my perspectives per perspective in on like what exactly are we trying to do here? We're trying to provide electrons and put that into a person's body at a rate that's higher than anything else, like. You know, like as far as the other therapies are concerned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, electrons, right. So, um, now, now I, I went to Ohio State. Boo, everybody go ahead. <laughs> and um, you were probably really going on Saturday, weren't you? Yep. Yeah. I was at the game, I'm like, anyways. Um, so, and I took a theoretical physics class. And it was divided in three sections. The middle section was quantum physics, like Einstein and special relativity and all that stuff. And I aced it. I totally got 100% on that particular test in my theoretical physics class. And I've always just kind of thought this way, like in the realm of like physics and electrons and orbits and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so fast forward now to um, in the last 12 months, and uh, I was at a seminar, actually it was earlier this year, and I was in, it was in Seattle, and um, the presenter was talking about work done by a guy, named, a guy named Fritz Albert Pop. he's in Germany, and he's been studying photons. What? Photons. Photons for 30 years. And there's about 40 organizations or individuals around the world studying photons. This is like new. This is, I mean, even though Fritz Albert Pop's been doing it for 30 years. He, I got a book in my inbox. It's a textbook. It's not in my inbox. It's just in front of it. It's on photons. Can you grab that? Um, and uh, so Fritz Albert Pop, he's the guy. Now, there's only a few videos on YouTube with him on it. And uh, most of them are in German. And I don't know German. But there's one video, and it, he was interviewed by a it looks like a Chinese guy, or maybe a guy was from Korea, I think it was Chinese. And the name of the TV channel was um, something like, um, like Master Supreme Television Network. So I think it was China. <laughs> but anyway, it was translated into eight languages. So as Fritz Albert Pop is talking, they have it written in eight different languages. And then there's a, somebody else talking in English. And so he defines, here, here's a book written by Fritz Albert, a textbook. Um, by Fritz Albert Pop. So I'm going to try to read this. Can you believe it? Try to read this thing. So, um, but what, but what, but he, but Fritz Albert Pop defined what a photon is. So, fo okay, so a photon is a particle of light. So we have light, which is a wavelength, but it's also a particle. Just like an electron is a wavelength, but it's also a particle. Okay, now the thing about an electron or a photon, is that it can be a particle and then turn into a wavelength 
and then turn it back into a, a particle. So that's where the transition is between energy and matter. Like at that just teeny, teeny, tiny, small, you know, size. That's energy and matter are one and the same. So like an electron, when it travels around the nucleus of an atom, it doesn't go like this, like the Earth goes around the sun. It'll be here, and then it'll disappear, and then it ha it'll have a propensity to reappear in a different place. So it may go from here, turn into uh, an energy wavelength, and then reappear back over here, or something like that. So that's just something like, that's really cool. Um, another thing about when you measure electrons or measure photons, when you pay attention to them, they start to move. And if you try to measure like the size of an electron, the more attention you put into trying to measure it, the least accurate, the less accurate your measurement will become. That's just how it goes. That's just how it is. So you're trying to look at something and it just starts to move. Just your obser observation of it, it starts to change. Okay? So we're getting to a realm that really like scientists, people who are like this kind of scientist, I'm a scientist. You ever meet those people? They work at Pfizer and stuff. They, they have no, they cannot, they can't understand this at all. <laughs> but quantum physics is the physics that describes all other sciences, to be honest. It is like the main, the main science. So, um, anyways, so Fritz Albert Pop discovered what he calls ultra-weak photon emissions, UPE. And he's got a machine that measures light. It's very, very sensitive. It can detect a candle 12 miles away. So it's pretty sensitive to light. And you can put it on your, you know, focus it on your body. And there's these photons that are emitting from your body at an ultra-weak uh, power. So ultra-weak photon emissions. And he's got, another, he's got a, another machine. It's a box. And he opens up the lid, puts a leaf in there, closes the lid, it's totally dark inside, and this machine is seeing the photons coming up off this leaf, and over the course of a minute or two, the amount of emissions starts to reduce. And then he opens up the box, pulls the leaf up to the light, it reabsorbs some, elect, uh, some photons, puts it back in the box, closes it again, and it's, it's radiant again, and it's emitting photons, and then gradually over time, their emissions over, the over a couple of minutes, the emissions go down again. So the point is, um, the plants and our bodies are absorbing photons and emitting photons all the time. Now, um, now Fritz Albert Pop, when he defined photon, he said, and this is key, he said it's an event. A photon is not a particle; it's an event, which is like makes my knees weak or something. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why he says that is because, okay, now I mentioned, who, who saw that video I made last week and we emailed out that video? No, nobody? Okay. Thanksgiving. Never. Nobody ever sees it. Anyways. No, um, Thanksgiving, maybe. Thanksgiving. Yeah? Okay. It was only three minutes, so. Anyways, um, so the point here, I mentioned this in the video, is that, um, let's just say, so the photons emitting um, is the event. Yeah, oh yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so the photon, oh yeah, so our DNA is a double helix, so it's two ladders, here's two ladders right here, and um, they wind up like this, They're, they wind on each other, and they wind together like this, so it's a double helix, you've seen the pictures, I could show you one, but DNA, yeah. So now in the video I talked about 90% of our DNA does not express as a body part, a body function, or body structure. It doesn't express as anything. 10% of our DNA does express. So like hair color, eye color, body structure, or size, blood pressure, cholesterol, all that stuff. Um, so the 90% of the DNA, at first, scientists, called it junk DNA. I don't know why I would say that. They didn't see that it did anything, so they just were going to throw it away. So they called it junk DNA. And that was stupid. And that was probably in the 80s. There's a lot of stupid things going on in the 80s. But as time has gone on, they discovered that 
there's different kinds of this 90% of the DNA, they have different functions. And so there's some DNA that, that um, they, in some way, they regulate the 10% that does express itself as your body. So there's like things that turn on, there's DNA that turns on and turns off, uh, protects, increases, decreases. There's all these categories of jobs that the so-called former junk DNA actually does. It actually regulates the 10%. So that, that right there is phenomenal to know that stuff right there. Um, so you can, now you can do things for your health to change your DNA. Oh, let me back up. The other thing about this double helix, it happens to be the perfect structure to store photons. Photons are stored in our DNA. How phenomenal is that? <laughs> raise your hand if you knew that. <laughs> if you raise your hand, I'm going to chop your arm off. Because <laughs> I know you're lying. So, um, so you have photons sitting in our cells, in our DNA, in our nucleus. And um, so this... So the photons actually turn on chemical reactions, and they turn off chemical reactions. And they do this at a rate of um, 100,000 reactions per second. So that's a lot of work. So how can it do that much work so fast? It can do it because it's light. Light is fast. Light travels at the speed of light, for Pete's sake. That's how fast it is. Now remember, at the very beginning, I was talking about the energy field having intelligence. Right? And light has some intelligence. And it's an event. <laughs> light has some intelligence. And it knows what chemical reactions to turn on and turn off. How is that? I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows how that is. But that's what light does. Now the light coming off this is incoherent, meaning there's no set pattern that all the wavelengths do. It's kind of scattered, just like the sun. It's incoherent. And that's the kind of light that our body really likes. And it'll take this in, and it'll turn it into coherent light, and then use it. And those, those coherent photon light particles will, lay, will stay in your body for like days or even weeks, maybe like four weeks, you can have one photon working at 100,000 chemical reactions per second for four weeks or maybe longer. How cool is that? Now there's lasers, we have, we have a bunch of lasers that has a red beam, you've seen those, and you can use those therapeutically, they help reduce inflammation, and we've been using them for a long time, They're, they work. Those photons, because they're coherent, right out of the laser, it's not the natural state of the sun. Those photons stay in your body for a second, or, or like one-tenth of a second. So they kind of like go in and then they're like done. Then they die or go away or bounce out. Or I don't know what they do, but they don't last in the body. Huh? They fizzle. Fizzle? Sure. <laughs> fizzle away. Yeah. They absorb. No, they don't. They absorb for one-tenth of a second up to a second. But then they're gone. They're not useful. But they're useful only when you have the laser on. Okay? So, um, ideally, it'd be cool if you, could, if you could have a laser that would emit that red light. And then also some photons, right? There's also a blue light laser, which is way more expensive. That has its own therapeutic uh, therapy, too. And there's also near-infrared lasers. And I have a friend that he makes one. He sells it for seven grand. And uh, the near-infrared near infrared laser actually goes in the body about this much. Whereas the red light only goes in about that much. And the blue light goes in about that much. And the photons will go into your body and they'll go wherever. You know, when you, when you have the correct incoherent laser putting a photon in your body, like let's say right here, it'll go down here. It'll go all over your, the photons go all over your body. So anyways, back to my buddy. So he, he makes these lasers. He sold, he's sold several hundred so far in the last five, six years. 
He sold two of them to a low back surgical center, like a spine center. He sold two. They were using them, and after a month, they threw them both away because they had lost $150,000 worth of surgery business. So they threw those lasers away so they could do surgery on people instead of actually healing them with light. Um, so just real quick, I got this laser right here. I plug it in. Yeah, awesome. Kristen, can you plug this in? I kind of want to stay in the camera. Yeah, here you can turn this on. Okay, look, this is a laser. It's LED lights. Go ahead and turn that on. Turn it to aches and pains. It's FDA approved for seven conditions. Now, see, it's starting to light up. You got blue and red, see that? And near infrared, which you can't see, and photons. So it's got all four of those laser, laser lights that I was talking about. It'll get better. There's the aches and pains right there. So that's got a 30 minute timer. Oh, and it's incoherent, so it doesn't hurt your eyes. You can look at it. Whereas a, like a red, like a beam, it'll burn your eyes. So this is totally safe to look at it. Oh, my eyes. <laughs> Thanks. How much would those cost if you want to do this? $1,500, which is crazy cheap. Cause, and the company that makes that, they set up the system to make them, and they got like four employees. And two of them are owners, and one person sits at the, behind the desk, and then the two owners and then the, the fourth person, they travel all over the country selling it. So they don't, their markup isn't that high. They, they're, they're crazy, these people. They just have like this really big purpose to prevent spinal surgeries and that kind of stuff. So that's a fantastic laser right there. What's the name of the product again? Saluma with a C, C-E-L-L-U-M-A. And the name of the company is Biophotas, P-H-O-T-A-S. I, yeah, I met the, these guys at a seminar, and there is a three-day seminar, and like on the last day, I finally decided I'm going to go talk to them. And then I saw the name was Biophotos. I'm thinking, wait, pho Biophoton? Do they know about photons? So I asked this guy some question, you know, a question. He started going off about biopho biophotons and really, I was like, stop. I'm sold. I already know all this stuff. So, anyways, that's that laser. So um, you, when you have some, when you use something like that, or you're standing in the sun, you're absorbing photons. Those photons are going into your DNA and you're literally recharging your body, okay? Now let me, let me kind of take you off on another subject that's related. It has to do with ATP. You understand if you don't know what ATP is? It's gotta be some people, yeah. So ATP is, it stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy, the body makes energy, and that's what it is. It's like, it's like 92 octane gasoline. Like, that's what you need for your car, and then ATP is what you need for your body, for energy. Got that? It's pretty simple, ATP. So, adenosine tri means three, phosphate is like phosphorus, phosphorus. And notice that phosphorus has the same kind of word as photon, with the PHO. When you look up phos, P-H-O-S, one of my, my favorite dictionary is like the Greek and Latin derivatives dictionary, the etymology dictionary. So you look up photon in that dictionary, it comes from, I don't know if it's Greek or Latin or what, but it comes from phos, which means light from within. So if you have um, red phosphorus and you expose it to oxygen, is it white or red? There's different colors of phosphorus. White or red, I can't remember which one. It starts to glow from within. The other word from the ancient Greeks or whatever, torchbearer. Okay, so when they store phosphorus, they store it in water so that the the, ox the you know the O2 or the, the oxygen in the air can't get to it. It's stable in the water. So um, the point here is that adenosine triphosphate it goes from your cells to a different location, and it dumps one phosphate 
or one phosphorus actually, plus an oxygen, and it becomes adenosine diphosphate, meaning two. So it goes from three phosphates to two phosphates. And the point here is that what it just dumped was light. <laughs> it just dumped light. That's the energy. Our body run the energy of our body is light. So ATP, which turns into ADP, that's light. Are you following me? It's phosphorus. Now this is, you know, when I was in sixth grade, we had a, like a science class, and we, I did, um, we had construction paper, and we did, we had pipe cleaners, and I glued pipe, pipe cleaners down, and I had a cell, which then did mitosis, right? It divided in half, right? And I had like four of these, like a series of four. And here's what happens when a cell goes from a normal cell, it starts to divide, now you have two cells. And I was in sixth grade, and I thought, well, what does this? That's what I thought in sixth grade. We know what happens, but what actually makes that happen? So, um, was it last year? Last year I was at a seminar, and there's a bunch of chiropractors and a bunch of doctors in the audience, and the person giving the seminar had a bunch of slides and videos, and it was cell mitosis. And it was DNA splitting in half and then replicating. And now you have two cells. He spent a day and a half just embellishing what I learned in the sixth grade. And at that point, I was like so frustrated. Like, at what point does our science evolve? What, at what point does our knowledge evolve with science, right? With, what, with its latest discoveries. So the point is, it's all light. It's all light that does this work. It makes these things happen. It causes the cell to split. It causes the DNA to unwind and split and then replicate. You follow me on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, now when we do this muscle testing, let me grab this, this supplement again. You know, your whole, the person's holding on to this, this pill right here and the body reads it. Well, the company that makes these pills there's one in Wisconsin, there's another one in Australia. They have a machine that they put the powder in or the pill in. It's called mass spectrophotometer. So, the, so it's in mass, large quantities, spec, like spectrum of pho, of light, o meter. So it's a meter that measures in mass the spectrum of light in the powder. So when they find out, let's say they get a bunch of like echinacea and they're going to find out, is this really echinacea? If it is, we can process it and then we can tablet it and we'll sell it. But they got to make sure it's real echinacea. And they got to make sure it's the right species. So they put this in the mass spectrophotometer and these, let, and these um, there'll, there'll be these spikes on a, on, a, on a readout. And they can say, yep, that matches what echinacea looks like. So therefore, it is echinacea. So the whole point is that this is light too, and and you know the companies are are using machines to measure the light. So when you when you hold on to this, and you're being tested, you're comparing the light of your body with the light of the supplement. And if these lights don't match up, your arm goes weak. And so if the lights do match up, your arm is strong. You follow me on that? So you got the message here. It's light. You guys know more than any medical doctor in the state of Michigan. <laughs> you do. So what, so what does this matter now? The matter is eat light. <laughs> you have to eat light. So um, where do you get light from? You get light from vegetables because they're sitting in the sun for a long period of time and then they're harvested and they eat them. Whereas Pepsi doesn't have light in it. I mean, it's, it, it'll have some light in it. But not like a cucumber or a tomato. Got that? Mm -hmm. Now there's a couple people um, online who I respect, and they advocate, and I don't advocate this, but they advocate eating raw vegan. So they're eating vegetables like all day long. And um, I mean, some bodies can have, and I have to say both of those men are very, they don't have shoulders anymore. They're like all caved in. They don't have pecs. You know, they just have lost their muscle mass. But um, they both say that their health is so much better and all that kind of stuff. I don't advocate that. But they're following along this, this, this idea 
of eating light, like raw vegetables. But you know what? Meat has a lot of light in it too, because the animals are outside, and they're eating grass, which has photons in it. See what I'm saying? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So, um, now... I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. What about the cows? It has a lot of meat, and the cow eats only grass. Yeah, they're gonna. They have photons in their bodies. You're gonna be, when you eat meat, you still get photons. You still get light energy from eating meat. Now, if you have an, or if you have pigs, right? I get um, meat from a farm in Manchester. I visited the farm, and I saw there were ten pigs, and the, those pigs had like four acres of grass thrown around. They weren't confined to a cage. They were outside. All those animals are treated really well, and they have free reign, and they and they run freely. So they're gonna have more light than a, you know, like a chicken that's stuffed in a cage with three other chickens their whole life, or something like that. Does that help? Does that answer that question? The more natural you get, the more close you are to the, to nature, the better off your body's gonna be. Yeah. So it just puts a whole new perspective on, because you're gonna, you'll see advertisements for the latest soy protein powder, and it has everything that you need. You know, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute, no, no, that's a totally processed synthetic protein powder. It's, it's not going to be as good as whatever meat that your body likes. And we do have protein powders. We sell them. I'm not a huge fan of them. I'd rather have people eat eggs and real, real, real meat. But if you're busy in the morning and you're rushing all around, it's, it's okay to have some synthetic protein powder. But there's less light in that than if you were to eat real, real food. Yeah. I know that a lot of the soy is genetically modified, but even if it wasn't, besides protein, Soy also has um, hormones, right? Right. Soy itself acts like estrogen. So then so. that complicates things. It's not just protein. Because like if right. you have beef or pig, is it going to be have um, hormones? Yeah, I mean, if it's conventional, they add hormones to it. But they give <laughs> right. Well, yeah, then you're fine. If it's organic, there's no hormones added. And there's right. no hormones naturally? No, there's hormones naturally. Like oh. if you eat a female cow, you're going to get some of the female cow hormones. Okay. Just imagine a lion eating a a male lion eating a female gazelle in Africa. The, the male lion's body will take all those hormones and just excrete them out. It's, the lion's not going to turn into a woman. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So it's natural to eat ovaries or testicles or thyroid or liver. It's totally natural, and your body just processes it the way it needs to process it. Not a big deal. But what, what farmers do is, for the conventional cows, they inject it with estrogen, and they keep loading up the estrogen over the course of six months. And the cow gains 200 pounds worth of water weight and fat weight, and then they sell it at the, at the higher price, and then they, then they butcher it. So it's just, you know, it's a manipulation of, of the natural state. So, um, the Human Genome Project um, was um, <clears throat> completed in uh, 2000, um, 2003. About 20 years ago. 2003. Look at that. There it is. And, um, so initially, the scientists were thinking, okay, I'll, they're thinking, they're wondering do he, how many uh, genomes do uh, humans have? And they're thinking like 100,000. Well, it's actually 21,000, so it's way less than what we're, they were thinking. And then they were thinking, of course, like the fruit fly would have, let's say, 5,000 because they're teeny tiny, and, and mice would have like 15,000, whatever. They just came up with all these numbers. Well, it turns out the fruit fly, fruit fly has like 35,000, and humans will have 21,000. So the size of the animal has no, it doesn't relate to the number of uh, genomes or, that we have. So, um, what are genomes? Um, well, we have a whole bunch of chromosomes. So chromosomes are made up of DNA, and you have a whole bunch of chromosomes like laid out together. As a group, that'd be a genome. 
Not that helps. Okay, so to, since 2003, all of medicine before that is sort of outmoded. It's outdated. Because the old medicine was, you have, oh, you have an ear infection, now you need this drug. Or you have this pain, now you need this drug. And the reason why I know is because I look in a book, and the book says you need this drug. Let's cook up medicine. But now that we know about, you know, DNA, we can actually test your DNA and find out exactly what your body needs. Exactly. And um, so L'Oreal, the cosmetic company, they're running DNA tests, they're developing a program to run DNA tests to find out what color lipstick you should be wearing. <laughs> and then um, Nestle is developing a program where they, they will test your DNA to find out what kind of junk food you should be eating from their, from their company. <laughs> True. And then hospitals are running DNA tests to find out which drug causes the least amount of harm to your body. True. So we, so we have a new genetic test, which I'll get into, and with this test, it run, it's uh, 45 different genes, and um, based on these genes, it has a program on what kind of exercise you should be doing, like the, more like the powerlifting stuff, the cardio stuff, yoga, meditation, those are completely different types of exercise. What kind of foods you should be eating, and even what kind of supplements you should be taking. And they told me all the way down to the pill count. So, um, and then they did, they run this test on 30,000 people in Texas, Florida, and Los Angeles. And um, what they discovered was that the people who were genetically guided, that's the term that they used, had um, five times better rate and endurance in their, in keeping their BMI down. So keeping the weight loss off five times longer than the people who were not genetically guided. And then another statistic was, people who were genetically guided regarding blood sugar had a, uh, double the rate of success and endurance in their success because they were genetically guided. So this is like the new medicine. It's like, what does your DNA want? And then you just do it. And you, do it, you can do it for the rest of your life. Now you can change your DNA, right, by doing these things. So you could take supplements, let's say, for a year, and now your DNA is different. And now you can stop that DNA, you can stop that, that those supplements. Yeah. So you can, yeah, it's not, it's not forever in stone that you're always going to have high blood pressure. Always, you know, that's one thing MDs like to say is that if you have high cholesterol, it's genetic, there's nothing you can do about it. Except take this pill every day. It's like, well, there's nothing you can do about it. And the pill itself won't help, whatever. But the point is, you can do a lot to reverse all this stuff. So one of my teachers, his name is Dan Pompa, um, P-O-M-P-A, he's a really cool guy. He's, he tested himself, he's got the, they're called, the, um, well, the overweight genes, he's got the high blood pressure genes, he's got the high cholesterol genes, and so does everybody in his family. He's the only guy, that, he's the only person that's thin with no high blood pressure and no high cholesterol because he eats really good food. And he's like, I think he's like 53 now. He looks like he's 29. So he has those genes? <clears throat> he has those genes, but he's turned them off. So this, that was just like a ten, tendency. Genes are like a tendency. Yeah. And if you... Right. Yeah, genes give us the propensity for a disease in the future. Mm -hmm. So you'll see families that'll have cancer, cancer, cancer. Mm -hmm. That's their genetic propensity. There's other families that are heart disease, heart disease, heart disease. Like that's my family's genetic propensity. So how do you turn on the heart disease genes and the cancer genes? Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Yeah, right. No exercise. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Bad food, bad food, bad food. You know, it's all the bad stuff that you already know about. And you reverse the bad stuff. And then you reverse those symptoms. And then when that happens, you know that you've reversed your DNA. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Have you reversed it or just turned it off? Turn it off. You turn off the bad genes, mm -hmm. turn on the good genes. Yeah. Cool? Yeah? All right, cool. So the good things, um, repairing the gut, removing toxins, 
and individual care for your DNA makeup. So how does this um, genetic testing compare with the arm testing? It's completely different. But they're both testing what your body wants. Yeah. Let me get to that in a bit. Okay, I promise I'll get to it. Um, so, um, these two mice have this exact same DNA, and um, they're manipulated by different foods that they were given to the mice. And um, so there was actually a name for this. So here is, okay, so the light color fur and the overweight mouse was given the bad food. This is the way that the mouse should look like, thin with dark hair. So the DNA was changed, or turned on, turned off. So the overweight genes were turned on, and the light colored hair was turned on. And you can see a progression, like you can change the, per the, the, per the mouse's hair by, by, change, by manipulating the DNA with lifestyle and food choices. See that? Gosh, and there was actually um, the name of the gene. They actually have a name for the gene. I can't remember what it is. But you could look it up if I remember the name of the gene. Agouti. A-G-O-U-T-I. If you look up agouti mice, you'll see these pictures. And it's a whole study on how we can change our, what, what DNA is on and what, what's off. A-G-O? A-G-O-U-T-I. Agouti mice. So I have this slide up because we have, on average, as individuals, about six pounds of friendly bacteria in our guts. These bacteria, bacteria are not your body. They live in your body. And you want them to be friendly. And how do you make them friendly? By eating good food. If you eat bad food, you're changing their DNA. And then they become nasty. And they start to cause symptoms. So now you're a gardener for these friendly bacteria. So not only are you taking care of your DNA, but you gotta take care of these guys' DNA. So I said before we have 21,000 genomes for our body. How many genomes do we have for all these bugs in our gut? The estimate, the, they estimate three billion. So this is huge, complex, multifactorial, varied microbiome. It's a microbiome. And plural would be microbiota. All these bugs would be microbiota. So you want to make sure that these are healthy. How do you make them healthy? Repair the gut. Eat good food. We got supplements to repair the stomach, the intestinal wall, the skull bladder, the pancreas, the large intestine. There's no silver bullet. That's the old school medicine. You got somebody with a disease, one symptom, one disease, one cure. That's Louis Pasteur. And everybody who follows that line of thought, Louis Pasteur's thought, they're trying to save the world with a silver bullet, a vaccine, a drug, you know, an inhaler. Look at me. It's simple. Whereas... It doesn't work that way for most of the time. It's multiple factors, not just one, but you have a cause with an effect, causing this effect, causing this effect, causing these effects, and it could just balloon out like this. So you have all the, the effects are the symptoms. So when you have this one silver bullet mentality, you can get rid of that effect, and you're like, yeah, sweet. I'm awesome. I got rid of that one. <laughs> Try to beat that. But no, how about that? You gotta get to that. 